This is Musings of the Shy Podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Hello, this is Rosia Shy with another episode in our ongoing series about Bitcoin and block size debate. Um, you know, Bitcoin's a messy bitch. Uh, episode 138. Hey guys, let's do it this way. Bitcoin Unlimited. On this episode, we're, we're going to change things around. Um, initially, I was going to start getting into SegWit, but with all that is happening with SegWit and the ramifications of SegWit itself, both SegWits, both SegWit, uh, the BIP uh, 141 and BIP 148, otherwise known as SegWit or SegWit uh, 2X, um, which is part of the New York agreement, we're going to switch things around. I think it's important to talk about Bitcoin Unlimited um, because it's, a, it's about a protocol that didn't come from necessarily from core developers that were either um, part of core, um, left, or a BIP that was created within core. It's a, a completely different type of a system. They, all, they have their own GitHub. They have their own different kind of a protocol. I talked about it last episode where I called it BERP instead of BIP. So talking about Bitcoin Unlimited. Now, they do have parts and aspects uh, they build off of the previous bit, but they have created an entire completely different type of, like I said, a system, different protocol, if you will, for uh, Bitcoin. And they're, you know, there are people out there that are currently running the nodes and mining Bitcoin Unlimited. So we need to talk about that. Uh, then we're going to talk about the new agreement. We, we've spoken about the Hong Kong agreement, but now there's a second agreement that came out of the consensus conference that took place in May in New York. So we're going to talk about that particular agreement. Uh, and then we're going to talk about nodes, decentralization, and hardware. And then we'll talk about um, the way of Bitcoin, because I think these things are important because these things that are being brought up over and over again in reference to both Bitcoin Unlimited and the other previous proposals that we talked about, which were Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, uh, talking about how these different proposals and the changes of uh, upgrading the block size from one megabyte to two megabytes or even four or eight megabytes is not going to allow for the decentralization of Bitcoin because people are not going to be able to run the nodes, how miners are not going to be able to uh, make a profit because they're not going to invest so much in hardware, uh, things of that particular nature um, is important. And then we're going to devote an entire week to SegWit. We're going to talk about the BIPs that make up the components of SegWit. We're going to talk about the people that are, are companies that are supporting the different Segwits that are out there, uh, what Bitcoin Big Core Bitcoin Core's position is, and what the two Segwits are, you know, which are Segwit of uh, BIP 141 and then uh, Segwit 148, and what that's going to entail. Because August night, no, August first is supposed to be basically the D day where uh, one of these Segwits is going to get activated. Either we're going to have a hard fork or not, and we'll, and we'll get into that discussion. It's pretty much. You know, the clock is ticking, if you will. And there's been some movement in both areas on this subject. But before we get into that, before we have the, you know, get out into the week, um, and this ever-shifting, initially planned out seven episodes, and now I think I'm on, I think, the 16th episode in this discussion, uh, we need to talk about the news a little bit. Centralized exchanges. This is from a Medium post. It's called The Elephant in the Crypto Room, Centralized Exchanges. This is from by user uh, Six Harp. Uh, the past few months have seen staggering growth in interest in market caps of all cryptocurrencies. No longer is our market an isolated one. Big names like Forbes, C- CNBC, Microsoft, uh, JP Morgan, IBM are beginning to take notice. But with the exceptional growth and enormous growing pains, Several major exchanges, including Kraken, Polonix, and even Coinbase, were unprepared for the massive influx of users in the past week. The market growing pays were evident in the error pages, uh, complaints, ridiculous wait times, and even threats of class action lawsuits. Just as the market grew, so it has begun to decline, and no wonder. New users are immediately discouraged away from our community because of system failures. This is not the experience we want new users in the cryptocurrency to experience. Our next article is going to talk about that because there was something that big that happened with um, Ethereum. Uh, we'll get into that. But yeah, the user experience when it comes to obtaining any cryptocurrency right now, besides if you're at the, well, you can mine Ethereum with GPUs and uh, because I guess the ASICs aren't out yet. Um, though my understanding of Ethereum and Ethereum Classic 
they were designed to be ASIC resistance, and there's a few cryptocurrencies that are like that. But some of the lower end coins out there that people like to trade and man around are coins that you can mine. So they're basically they're in, they're like energy coins where you put amount of energy to create the coins for the sole purpose of trading up to either a Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like that. They don't have any utility. People aren't really fundamentally using them. It's just like you know miners mining. And I guess there's a marketplace where people, if they're trading them and hoping they eventually have some kind of value beyond besides the, the mining or the hashing power, then there's that. And it's a little weird when it comes to those type of coins. But if you're looking to mine, if you're looking to get into cryptocurrency and you don't have a bank account, you don't want to do KYC or AMLA or AML, then you might go off and mine or you try to earn Bitcoin. Um, Open Bazaar. So made some a few announcements. They show some displays of their um, Open Bazaar 2.0. They have an app that they're coming out with a launch as well. I, I would imagine in the next couple months we're going to see something that looks very neat. Uh, you also have Purse.io, which I did a review of on uh, Hiroshi Stop Bubble, where you can sell things on uh, Amazon as a store and get paid in Bitcoin. Uh, what's another way? You, just, you know, the other ways to earn Bitcoin. Yours. Uh, they switched from Bitcoin to Litecoin. We'll do an update about yours, uh, especially when it's launched. They've had a few test articles out there where you can pay with Litecoin. Uh, they're working with some little functionality issues with uh, getting uh, push notices when you get paid and things of that nature. There's Steemit out there, which you can get paid in Steemit. There's other ways, you know, there's different ways of earning Bitcoin. There's different uh, markets out there where if you have a job or a task that you can perform. We talked about that in 21.co. Or if you perform these little micro machine tasks, you can get paid in Bitcoin. So there, there are ways around to which you don't have to uh, input your, your governmental information and have it uh, out there. But for the most part, for mo the majority of people, they're going to have to purchase Bitcoin and they have to deal with these exchanges. And it's really it's a significant tour. Ever since basically the, in the States, really, uh, the, the IRS regulations pretty much it's killed the exchange market here in the States where there's basically only three. It's like Coinbase, uh, Kraken, and uh, the ETF, the uh, not the ETF, but the Gemini, uh, the, the Facebook twins uh, exchange. And then there's exchanges around the world. Uh, some of them accept U.S. customers, but most of them don't because of the banking and regulations here in the States. At the same time... Um, you know, you have local Bitcoin, which I'm not sure how long that is going to last, really, with um, the crackdowns that have been going on with the money transmitting, you know, people going to certain felony time for not having a money transmitting license. So the state of New Hampshire, and I guess we'll eventually do an update as soon as we get done with the, the uh, Bitcoin uh, block size debate, uh, has passed a law stating that you don't need a money transmitting license or it's in the works, really. Uh, money transmitting license within the state of New Hampshire to deal with cryptocurrencies, and there's other stuff that's on the federal level that's very draconian. So it's very difficult, really, if you want to get into this space to participate. You have to really, once you go through the process, which is the same type of process with banking, which uh, cryptocurrencies are supposed to be a solution to, you have to have some capital, whereas before, in the beginning, you really didn't have to have much capital. You can have 5, 10, 20 bucks and still have, you know, crypto in your hand eat or part of crypto in your hand and these issues with these exchanges uh, some of them are not built or designed very well they have significant customer service issues which is a big issue in tech altogether where you can't really even talk to a human being or even a chat bot person really um, it's very difficult very hard there is almost in this old school fashion where you have to do email do things by the mail really if you think email is a mail type of system where if you wanted to get in touch with Sears Robux and you lived out in the boonies um, and you couldn't drive into the city that like, might have been like 100 or 150 miles away from you, you you had to do everything by correspondence and that took time and effort. And I guess with those type of things, you know, even though Sears may have valued you as a customer, uh, the chance they probably did the numbers, the chance of you applying a warranty or getting in touch with them and stuff like that was very minimal. But And I guess they're bet, betting on that in the, in the sense um with these type of companies, which is ridiculous. One of the, there's like, eventually I guess we'll talk about it, but there's some of the serious, consistent core fundamentals that are wrong with a lot of tech companies is utility, uh, you know, the UI interface, look at things, you know, making it so that 
anyone can utilize your system, uh, customer service, uh, PR relationships, human resources, and just a diversity of thought or thinking or flexibility of thinking within these with this industry is really, 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 I think, killing, um, particularly Silicon Valley, killing a lot of different aspects of that marketplace where you're seeing a lot of gains and growth in tech sectors and other parts of the world globally, if you will, because of this um, rigidness, if you will. But to get back to the article. Imagine you're diving into cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency for the first time. You're excited, maybe a bit nervous, and ready to get started. To your horror, you are met with a message that says you need to wait for approximately one month to be verified before you can trade. You are promptly open a support ticket and outrage when it takes more than three weeks to get an answer. Like anyone else probably would, you decide investing in cryptocurrency is obviously not worth the time and effort. People may assume that these lamentable problems are with companies and their short staff or low resources. Even others may say this is a particular co- company's fault for not anticipating the flood of users. I would argue, however, that the problem is even more structural. The pains we are experiencing come from one specific problem, centralization. Centralization means there's too much power and decision-making left to the whims of one single company or, indi- or individual. For, for instance, Poloniex, a popular crypto exchange, delisted 17 coins on May 2, 2017. Almost overnight, the coins lost 90% of their value. This is an unfortunate example of centralization at work. Poloniex, the number one exchange by volume at the time of this writing, was able to decide the fate of all these coins, not the community at large. This is not how it should be. You could lose 90% of value overnight at the hands of Poloniex and be powerless to stop them. So what do we do? The way Bitcoin decentralized money, we need a way to decentralize the exchange of decentralized money itself. There are several projects trying to do just that, and getting involved early can mean a huge return on investments. Companies like Waves, BitShares, and Leica have started taking steps towards a decentralized exchange. But there's one solution in particular that is ahead of the game, BlockNet which had a head start since it's been develop, developing this since 2014, before even anyone realized how crucial this would be now in 2017. BlockNet is one of those only projects that is pursuing fully decentralized cryptocurrency exchange by utilizing a specific blocking chain routing technology to allow for peer-to-peer coin exchange without the need for a middleman. Put it simply, you, you maintain 100% ownership of your coins during the exchange. You never have to trust someone else to hold your coins for you. And this is what blockchain was originally about. That it empowers you to be your own thing. This is not just, just a theory. The first fully decentralized LTC BTC transaction has already been completed in April by BlockNet dev team. The decentralized exchange is now in the final stages of, u- of user interface development. I think uh, BizSquare, which changed its name to uh, uh, Bis- BISQ.io, uh, it shortened it, um, <clears throat> is also in the, in the similar game as well. In other ways, the BlockNet team is now working on making the decentralized exchange more accessible and easier to use. Too many people are putting their trust in third-party exchanges, and besides the horror stories we've seen unfold, Mt. Gox and Cripsy have lost hundreds if not thousands of people's fortunes and life savings, yet exchanges like these are still the dominant trading solution. And not only is decentralized exchange important for the health of the crypto community, it's also a great investment opportunity if you're looking for one. If you missed out on Bitcoin and Ethereum at a bit above your price range, this could be a huge opportunity for you. Making huge returns on investment in crypto market isn't difficult. You just need to find a problem and project that solves it, solves it in its youth. BlockNet is such a project right now. Um, this is not investment advice. I would highly recommend you you know, you know, do your due diligence. Uh, this is one of many solutions out there seeking to, to decentralize exchanges. Uh, there's more in the article, but I just wanted to share this because of the issue at hand with Ethernet, they had a, a flash crash, which had all sorts of problems. It's from CNBC. Ethereum briefly crashed from $319 to $0.10 cents in, in seconds on one exchange after a multi-million dollar trade. Ethereum briefly suffered a flash crash on the GDAX exchange on Wednesday. The price fell from 319 to $0.10 cents in a matter of seconds. Many Ethereum traders lost large sums of money, and the cryptocurrency later rebounded. Uh, this article is written by Ajahn Kar- Uh The price of Ethereum crashed as low as ten cents from around three nineteen in about a second on JTX, the cryptocurrency exchange, on Wednesday. A move that's being blamed on a multi-million dollar market sell order. Ethereum is an alternative digital currency to Bitcoin and has been trading as high as three fifty two on Wednesday. It since rebounded from the, cra- the flash crash lows to trade about three twenty five on the GTX exchange. And according to the industry and price tra- tracking websites, CoinMarketCap, which takes into account the price on several exchanges, 
Ethereum was traded around 338. Um, Adam White, the vice president of GTA, G, GDX, which is run by the U.S. firm Coinbase, posted on the Shane's uh, blog outline, blog outline which, which took place at around 12.30 p.m. Um, Wednesday. And according to White, the multi-million dollar market sale order resulted in the number of orders being filled from $317.81 to $224.48. As the price continued to fall, another 800 stop loss orders and margin funding liquidation caused Ethereum to trade as low as $0.10. Cents. A stop loss order is a trade that is executed automatically once the security in the case Ethereum hits a particular price. Margin funding is essentially trading with borrowed funds, and liquidation is when these positions are closed automatically in order to prevent further losses. The knock on selling effect to cause a flash crash on GTX. The chart below is a screenshot of the GX, GDX price showing the high and low price. Many on social media criticized GTX and alleged there was some sort of illegal activity taking place in GDX and devices. Our initial investigation shows no indication of wrongdoing or account takeovers. We understand the event can be frustrating for our customers. Our matching engine operated as intended throughout the event and trading with advanced features like margin always carries inherent risks. We're continuing to conduct a thorough investigation and will keep customers updated with any resulting actions, uh, White said in the blog post. White also noted that these trades are final and will not be reversed. The exchange temporarily holds a trading of Ethereum on Wednesday before restoring the system shortly after. As well as the issue on GTX, investors demanded the funding launch of the Ethereum-based messaging app called Status clog the Ethereum network and in industry insider told CNBC. Ethereum traders were outraged by the crash, blaming GTX for not having proper controls and even accusing whoever put the sell order in a market manipulation. And it was painfully experienced for many. On a social forum, Reddit users complained of losing, losing large sums from 3000 to 9000 We also seem to be a large money-making event for some, too. On the trading forum, Scott Stock Twits, user John Demias posted a screenshot of trading history. And around the time of the crash, it showed one person had an order in just for over 3,800 Ethereum if the price fell to $0.10 cents on the GTX exchange. Theoretically, this person would have spent $380 to buy these coins, and when the price shot up above 300 again, the trader would be sitting on over $1 million. CNBC has unable to verify the screenshot posted by DMAS. Uh, cryptocurrency excitement. The Ethereum cra- crash comes amid rising interest in the broader cryptocurrency days. Both Bitcoin and Ethereum hit record highs recently and have both seen pullbacks. Ethereum in particular has been talked, to, talked up because of the blockchain technology that underpins it. Whereas Bitcoin and blockchain is seen as a payment network, Ethereum has been designed to support so-called smart contract applications. And this kind of goes on. So that's what happened with Ethereum. And I believe there was even one more crash on a different exchange. Or maybe just the same crash with different numbers here. Hold on. Business Insider. Now, a number of people, but it hasn't been verified yet, and it's still, you know, everything's being investigated and checked out, is that <clears throat> this might have been a result of GTX being uh, DOS, DODOS, and that this is a result of that, more so than um, just a sell order or a large sell order. But this today is Friday recording. This took place Wednesday of June 21st, so... We'll see. We'll see how things shake out. It'll probably take about a week and really a month for any solid or serious empirical evidence to demonstrate what happened um, on that day. But again, this is the result of having centralized exchanges where one exchange could, not only for those traders, but affect the market as a whole, where people are having serious qualms and issues with uh, Ethereum in general. And we'll talk about um, Ethereum since we're coming on to the the DAO uh, hack and issue and the the fork that occurred, uh, that anniversary, if you will, um, we'll do a bit of an update on where the state of Ethereum is with these ICOs and things of that nature. But moving on, Russians uh, Gazprom Bank tests quantum safe blockchain. This article comes from uh, News BTC, written by um, Gotham. The technology behind computers is evolving at a rapid pace. Quantum computers, the next generation of computing, is already within reach. I believe Microsoft or somebody just announced um, a significant quantum computing breakthrough. Um, I'll look into it, but we'll just stick to the story at hand. Uh, many leading companies have so far demonstrated varying degrees of success in development and trials of quantum computing machines. And as the world inches closer to using these devices, there are various concerns raised from different 
industry segments. Cryptocurrency industry members are also concerned a lot as they believe that quantum computers may render the cryptographic algorithms used by various blockchain protocols useless. However, there have been speculation about quantum proofing the blockchain and results in researchers at the Russian Quantum Center have done just that. According to recent media reports, a leading Russian bank, Gazaprom Bank, has announced that it has successfully tested a quantum-safe blockchain. The development comes as good news for the banking and financial sectors across the world, as most of them are fast-tracking the research, development, and implementation of blockchain technology for their operations. The Russian Quantum Center is said to be working on implementation of the same or improved version of the quantum-safe blockchain solution in other banks across and beyond the country. The new blockchain is said to incorporate a combination of quantum key distributed distribution and post-quantum cryptography to render the algorithm virtually unhackable. These quantum keys will replace the traditional digital signatures and ensure the blockchain is future-proof. The Bitcoin community is also contemplating the implementation of a similar quantum-proof cryptography to its blockchain. However, given the current circumstances where the developer community is taking ages to implement scalability solutions, there is no definitive timeline for the much-required upgrades of Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the quantum key distributing networks are already becoming prevalent in many countries, especially in China, Europe, and the United States. These quantum networks are being used for smart contracts, financial transactions, and highly, other highly sensitive digital transfer. If the quantum safe uh, blockchain is made open source, then there's a highly high probability of a widespread implementation of the new age technology across industry. The Ukraine to collect personal income tax on cryptocurrency. Uh, this is from CoinDala. And the author is Nina Long. We're going to talk about some of these legislative actions that have been going on. Uh, you know, India is looking to permit Bitcoin to be uh, a currency within their country, just like Japan, a payment method. We have the United States doing some shenanigans. Um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of this. I, as I stated um, earlier in the year, this is going to be pretty much the year where we're going to see a lot of legal um, implementations happening within the cryptocurrency space. Uh, the financial community of the Ukrainian government has published a draft law that suggests changing the regulation of money transfers, including cryptocurrency. According to a report by local news media, the draft of the law number 5361 significantly changes the approach to the questions of digital currency issue and circulation. In particular, it proposes allowing the release of digital money to, not only to banks, but also to other financial institutions that have licenses. The head of the tax and custom practice of Vashini and Partners Company, Maria Soterveya, suggests that the adoption of this law will increase the turnover on electronic wallets of Ukrainians. She stated that it will allow individuals to pay taxes, fees, and more charitable contributions. She further noted that in 2016, the National Bank of Ukraine counted about 40 million e-wallets with an annual turnover of about 3 billion UHS or 113 million USD. The new law should increase the control over digital money circulation, and this means there are risk of additional personal income tax on cryptocurrencies. However, Maria Soltorva pointed out that digital currency is a means of payment that can be used or may not be used by individuals. Thus, if there's no transfer of fiat, they should not be considered an income. In her opinion, the legislators should recognize the digital currencies as securities first in order to be able to calculate a person's income. But so far, the position of tax authorities has not changed. I have a link in the show notes about from the MIT Technology Review, Business Impact of the Cryptocurrency Market is Growing Exponentially uh, by Emerging Technologies from the R14. Uh, uh, it was published May 29th, 2017. Um, you can read at your ledger. We're going to talk about MIT because there's been a couple of things that have been happening with MIT in regards to cryptocurrencies that I think is very important. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, Bitcoin.com by Kevin Helms. Local Bitcoins introduces a new fee structure. So in the face of rising Bitcoin network transaction fees, uh, the premier over-the-counter exchange Local Bitcoins is enacting several changes to their fee structure. The company aims to cover the high fees by spreading the cost fairly among customers. The new fee structure. Local Bitcoins has introduced a new fee structure which will affect all customers, citing the rising Bitcoin network fees the company announced on Tuesday the details of the new fees. In order to divide the cost of handling Bitcoin transactions in a fair manner, we are introducing deposit fees for incoming transactions. At the same time, we will be lower Bitcoin sending fees for all customers. The new fee system will be put in effect around the 19th or 21st of June, so it's already been implemented. Uh, the Finland-based company with Bitcoin sellers and buyers in almost every country further explained that you can save further on sending fee, fee by timing your transactions to when the network is quiet. 
However, the new deposit fees will be larger than the new sending fees. They disclose adding that generally we expect it to be about three times the amount of the sending fees per transaction. The existing fee structure on local bitcoins has a drawn has the drawback of overcharging fees to users withdrawing bitcoins, but none to the depositing them. Sellers will now be covering two bitcoin network fees, one for the cost of sending the coins to an escrow and the second from the escrow to the buyer. With the new fee system, we want to spread these coins more fairly between our customers, the company wrote. Over the years, local bitcoins found that a large part of each bitcoin transaction fees was used to cover the cost related to deposits, not withdrawals, the company clarified. That means customers who make many small deposits to their local bitcoin wallets cost the sending transaction transaction fees to rise, and these costs were paid by customers who were sending bitcoins. The new deposit fee will ensure that customers who make lots of small network transactions that cost large network fees will pay a larger share of the overall transaction costs. Meanwhile, the customers who merely withdraw their coins will enjoy lower fees. Also announced on Tuesday was an automatic fee adjustment feature on every transaction based on how congested the Bitcoin network is. Traffic to the Bitcoin network will be constantly monitored and fees adjusted to ensure that overall fees paid are smaller, uh, local Bitcoin claims. So we'll see. Uh, we'll check in on this. I would say I'll give it 90 days to see what the market reaction is to local bitcoins. If it's going to pretty much be the same, nothing different, or there's going to be some changes, or you'll see uh, comp competition. Um, on so Bitcoin Unlimited, it's the third one out there when it comes to different proposals and solutions. This is actually a third one in creation. It comes after Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Classic. Uh, so we're going to read the Wicca, then we're going to talk about who's supporting it, and its place in the whole discussion of the block size debate. So Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is a full node software client for the Bitcoin network. Compared to the Bitcoin Core client hard coding the block size limit to one megabyte from which it is forked, Bitcoin Unlimited does not hard card the limit uh, hard code the limit, allowing the users to signal which block size limit they prefer, finding the limit having a majority consensus and set it and set their block size limit to that value. The release of Bitcoin Unlimited follows the release of Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Classics uh, alternative proposals which aim to increase Bitcoin transaction capacity of around to 2.5 to 3 transactions per second by increasing the hard coded block size limit. Uh, this came out uh, January 2016th, it is developed by Andrew Stone. It uh, has a, Git a GitHub, Bitcoin Unlimited site. It also has RPTC, which is a very huge av uh, Reddit advocacy group for Bitcoin Unlimited, but also other different proposals and, and issues within the Bitcoin space. It was created by Roger Ver, who is one of the backers of Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, as a way to counter some of the dialogue that was occurring on um, our Bitcoin. And... We've talked about it before about this, the censorship and the issues concerning these um, forums that are centralized and controlled by single individuals. Uh, but uh, there's a little bit of a digression. Uh, it's written in C++, uh, since we talked about how there's Bcoin, which is JavaScript, and these different other, you know, co-written languages that allow for more adopt, you know, flexibility and adaptability of Bitcoin. Uh, it is written in C++. You can use it on Windows, Linux. Uh, ARM, you know, you know, Mac OS. So here we go. <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is an attempt to upgrade Bitcoin Core into a client that processes Bitcoin transactions into blocks with a potential maximum size greater than the Core's hard-coded limit for one megabyte. The one megabyte size limit was added in 2010 by Satoshi Nakamoto as a temporary anti-spam measure. This limited the maximum network capacity to about three transactions per second. For the advocates of the, ch the change, the block size increase is needed in order to avoid a workflow bottleneck due to the number of transactions made as Bitcoin adoption increases. Uh, Burp documented the proposal and was drafted by lead developer Andrew Stone. Uh, we'll get into the Burps in a second. Uh, with Bitcoin Unlimited, miners are independently able to configure the size of the blocks they will validate. Maximum generation size, also referred to as MG, is the new parameter for, for which by default is set to one megabyte. The software allows users to adjust, its, adjust it and select the size of blocks that produce excessive block size, or EB parameters, allows nodes to choose the size of the block they accept. By default, this is set at 16 megabytes. The third new parameter allows a user to select the excessive acceptance depth, or AB, that implements a consensus strategy by retroactively accepting larger blocks if a majority of other miners have done so. Uh, miners using Bitcoin Unlimited continue to process regular-sized blocks. 
but as soon as a block larger than one megabyte is, mon is mined, they will follow the chain containing the most work. Per the Bitcoin Unlimited website, the scalability solution will be found at the focal point. That is, the size limit of the block is expected to naturally emerge from the cumulative effort of thousands of node operators and miners expressing the preference. Uh, propo proponents Bitcoin Unlimited's continuous transaction capacity increase method Bitcoin used for much of its existence. Uh, business analytics and crypto analysis Eli Arvin claimed that the one megabyte number associate input in the code follows no real decision point, but rather a simple rounded number limit that was never supposed to be reached, except that we did reach the number, and as a result, many users are now paying well over the $1 uh, USD per transaction. As uh, support, Bitcoin Unlimited follows the release of Bitcoin XT and Bitcoin Classic, our alternative proposal of how the increase of Bitcoin's transaction capacity. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is actively supported by Roger Bear. Mining pools include Antpool, Bitcoin.com, uh, BTC Top, uh, GP miners and via BTC uses BU. As of March 2017, around 11,000, uh, not 11, but 11% of the nodes run BU. We'll see if that has since changed with some of the things going on with uh, opposition while I'm looking this up. Uh, developers of Bitcoin Core have been reluctant to increase the Bitcoin size. Core developer Luke Jr. even claimed that the current limit is too large and that all legitimate use of Bitcoins amount to approximately 750k block average. For David A. Johnson, the emerging consensus mechanism could lead to a network split. Uh, we already talked about emerging consensus. Uh, furthermore, critics are worried about the small amount of BU developers and the lack of peer review of the new code. A bug in the BU caused Bitcoin.com to mine an invalid block on February 2nd. BU nodes were attacked after developers brought a bug to light on March 14, 2017, and the number of nodes hosting Bitcoin Unlimited fell to about 370 from 780 following the attack, the lowest number since October, and returning to about 780 within 24 hours, according to the website CoinDance, which tracks network data. On April 24th, 70% of Bitcoin Unlimited nodes crashed due to memory leaks, and on May 8th, roughly 70% of all Bitcoin Unlimited nodes went offline again. The exact reason is none unknown, but BU developer Andre Susan suggested it was related to the N to the extend protocol or feature of BU. So it has some issues. It's, it's actually pretty buggy compared to the other proposals out there. Uh, but one of the key things about it, and we're going to talk about it because it talks about it here in the Wicca, is that it seeks to be an alternative development to Core. That Core shouldn't be the sole developers on Bitcoin, that there can be as many developers as necessary, and they can push any proposals out there to the community and as a matter of obtaining consensus. So here we go. Governance. Bitcoin Unlimited seeks to de democratize the software development process. The protocol used by Bitcoin Unlimited is administered by a formal process described in the Articles of Federation. The software lead developer or maintainer is be to be elected annually. The elected positions consist for a president in charge by a high-level management and an elected secretary to deal with administrative issues. The president of Bitcoin Unlimited is Andrew Clifford. Uh, Peter Risen is the secretary of Bitcoin Unlimited. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited has a number of developers, including Peter Tashish. Andre Susie, Andrew Stone, and Army so Sheast. So I guess extension blocks is what is being labeled here for um, for proposals that are being supported by the miners. That's 2.7 percent of the hashing power. Uh, BIP 100, which is you know part of uh, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, is 3.5 percent. And then we have segregated witness, which is 36%. Oh, emerging consensus, which is Ample, Bitcoin.com, BTC, Canoe, Slush Bowl, VIPT, is at 41.3% of the Bitcoin mining network supports emerging consensus. So that's Bitcoin Unlimited. I wonder what this extension block is. I'm going to have to look more into it. And then we have SegWit uh, times 2 is 58.1% of the hashing power. So let's look at the nodes. There are 140 Bitcoin Classic nodes, 20 Bitcoin XT nodes, 785 Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, so there hasn't been really an increase in there. Uh, 6,261 Bitcoin Core nodes, that's kind of a bit of a drop for them. And that is of uh, June 23rd. So that's Coindance. Let's see what 21Co has for the nodes. Okay, so they Bitcoin knows doesn't break down. So it looks like it's not breaking down. Oh, here we go. All right, so 
user agents, the clients are 14.1, 14.0, we have 36.38% of no's, that's 2,722, 858 is 11.47%, Bitcoin Unlimited is actually down to 591, and then you have 14.20 version of the nose is 552, 12.01 uh, is 541, and 13.1 is 497 so Bitcoin Unlimited is still hanging in there as far as no counts are going but it doesn't have the largest I'm not positive of which client is already single singling SegWit I guess when we discuss um, I think it's 14.0.140 is the client that began has SegWit already in it but I could completely be wrong there. Um, let's see what Network Map does. If they have a clearer picture here to uh, BitNose uh, 21 Co. Company. And they have a pretty impressive map across the grid where you can look at these nodes and the, how they're bundled up. It's pretty impressive, very spatial, if you will. It's on a grid. It has these little dots, and you can go by uptime of 24 hours. Uh, sync nodes with twenty, you know, different sync times. Nodes that are syncing, uh, nodes with uptime at fifteen minutes. Uh, you can reset the network. So it doesn't give a clearer picture than Coin Dance. But if you want to look at Bitcoin nodes, they have uh, Twenty One Co. I did a review of them on Hiroshi Sot Bubble. They also are helping people um, calculate their the transaction fees they need to do. They track. They do the service for the nodes. They're also a mining company. They had the, the we talked about it, the little bit overpriced uh, Bitcoin uh, mining machine, but they also have the uh, networking platform that they're doing via email and identity through their service. So check out that review. It's on Hiroshi Stop Bubble. It's also in the uh, uh, network feed as well. So let's read the hidden history of Bitcoin Unlimited and then we'll talk about uh, the burps. So this was written um, April 8th, 2017 at CoinDesk by uh, Paul Ellett Ines and Rachel Rose O'Leary. In this guest feature, uh, Elliot Ines and O'Leary retrace the history of Bitcoin Unlimited, the Bitcoin implementation seeking to become the dominant software on the network through a solution to the network's long-standing scaling debate. In the midst of the scaling debate, is very difficult. it can be difficult to uncover the, the genealogical roots of various competing projects. The internet operates at the clip that renders analysis of how an open source project emerged closer to detective work than it should be. And into the mix of rumors, mixed rumors, and you know, disinformation, one really has their work cut out for them. In certain cases, personalities might descend the murk and become quasi-official figures as evident in the proselytizing of Andres Anonopoulos, the let the code speak for itself, uh, quietisms of Peter Will, or the informed whimsy of Sam Samson Mo. However, it's not always the case that important figures with the cryptocurrency ecosystem are visible at all, even when their actions have significant impact on the network. This is essentially true with the case of the Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, initials BU, where in, the con in contrast to the well-known developers associated with Bitcoin ca uh, Classic, which is uh, Gavin Andreessen's, and Bitcoin XT, which is Mike Hearn, which was the first uh, proposal that didn't exactly come from the Bitcoin core. Uh, the key developers of BU are not familiar names. A little bit of history, and then would it not be remiss in such an atmosphere if it not more than to make clear that in the end, the two sides of the debate are populated by pretty normal folk who are just happy to disagree on a pretty arcane set of ideas a bit Ideas with expensive re repercussions. Early roots. Like most open source projects, Bitcoin Unlimited is broadly a virtual community consisting of a motley crew of developers, writers, journal journalists, and onlookers. They are invariably people already involved with the Bitcoin for many years, and BU arose primarily from a single thread on the Bitcoin talk known as the gold collapsing Bitcoin up. Like numerous such threads, debates were often heated, quite personalized, and partisan. There are certain key figures at the time who seemed to have a real impact on giving the new community a degree of confidence to expand beyond core. Uh, Dr. Peter Risen was clearly a significant voice and looks to have provided much of the intellectual weight behind the use through it. theoretical comments such as how transaction fees would occur with a network without a block size limit. 
Uh, Risen's ideas are effectively a response to the possibility of removing the current limit of one megabyte as expressed in BIP 101, an improvisational proposal authored by Gavin Andreessen. They propose raising the block size limit to 8 megabits and implementing a biannual doubling thereafter in order to deal with the problem of full blocks and expensive transaction fees. BIP 101 was never adopted and it has its own history with earlier scaling debates. However, it did inspire participants in the gold collapsing Bitcoin up thread to seek out new solutions. Gathering Steam uh, The BU operation played out in the thread through summer 2015, gathering pace as the Bitcoin blockchain began to feature higher fees. According to Risen, the four-week transactional average record on June 2015 had grown 376 times greater than it was seen in September 2010. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine reports tens of thousands of unconfirmed transactions as a block size train to accommodate new network usage. A little later, a post by Risen in July 2015 noticed the average block size had blown to 70% capacity and was continuing to surge. Uh, it's pretty much at capacity, even though there has been less transactions going on just because of the fee. I guess you might say that's our market response, but it's still, it's still an issue. Uh, discussions on Bitcoin talk escalated, but the thread was soon locked in what the BU community read as a form of censorship. The perceived villain of the piece ha- here was Bitcoin talk administrator Thamos, and the same acquisition from BU members were carried over to our Bitcoin, another online platform also administrated by Thamos. Unlimited supporters turned to RPTC that, of course, core supporters have tended to consider heavily censored, resulting in a kind of intellectual split there, that whatever the technical details is written with, what can appear to the outsiders a quasi uh, conspiratorial paranoia. The takeaway is that once untethered from the, the perceived poor, cl- poor climate of Thamos dominated media, Bitcoin alone set out on its own path, allowing for a period of off grade development that would quietly emerge just as core supporters assumed that segreg- segregated witness would be implemented, which it wasn't. Grudge match. This essentially meant that when a form of, com- of competition did emerge, Bitcoin core was blindsided and broadly unprepared. This does not mean they were technically not ready, but rather they had overlooked two subtle development miners, were not entirely convinced by uh, SegWit, and not everybody completely accepted that it was the obvious solution. They set up the scheme of ideological confrontation. On the forums at BU, the idea of a new Bitcoin software did not occur immediately. Such tasks required a dedicated developer or de- a development team. But it wasn't until Andrew Stone, uh, the Zurge, began to post the idea in an alternative client that was, was a real movement. Here it is actually, BIP 100, authorized by Jeff Garzik and others, that is most influential since it explicitly puts the decision about removing the block size limit in the hands of the miners through a voting process. Those who have been following the debate will know that a large amount of current discussions center on the role of miners, most often a, a core of Chinese pools, and that to that extent should be influenced the future of election of Bitcoin. Figures involved with these pools, such as Jean Wu, have taken on almost a shadowy status of malign agents look to stall the adoption of SegWit in order to maintain their stranglehold on transaction fees. No doubt there is some truth to the claims of self-interest. Uh, you know, there's Ace of Boots, there's other things. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about doomsday scenarios and uh, when we talk about those who are against uh, both SegWits or just one over the other. Nobody is surely naive to think that otherwise. However, the salient aspect of Bitcoin Unlimited is that Having the miners on the side meant than having a voice. The kickoff. If Bitcoin can be read, and no doubt many will have other interpretations as a set of influential blocks, not always in competition, then the two most influential voices are surely those of core development team, technical credentials, and the large Chinese mining pools, hash rate credentials. The current scaling debate only really kicks off when it becomes clear that not only are many of the major pools not supporting SegWit, but they're actually signaling for Bitcoin Unlimited. This is thought by many as a very risky, risking a hard fork of the network into rival blockchains, given how serious the division between core and unlimited are. The, uncurrent, the undercurrent to all this are the socioeconomic arguments underlying Bitcoin Unlimited. In Peter Risen's original BU white paper, you first encounter a, a now uh, similar familiar concept in the emerging consensus, EC, which we define. And EC maintains that given the economic incentive remaining on the same chain, miners will reconfigure their blocks to size to match the majority of the network. Notably, the white paper includes a section that explicitly, explicitly about the values, not just the technical themes, and that can be summarized as a focus on the speedy transaction of Bitcoin as cash, not gold, ensuring low fees and being censorship resistant. It's perhaps a, this approach that first caught the attention of the noted Bitcoin investor Roger Baer, who told us, I actually don't recall where I first came across BU, but I suspect it was Reddit. Avir almost certainly must have come across it browsing the subreddit sympathetic to Classic and XT, 
but one can easily see why he found BU appealing. As an outspoken investor, he's been constantly vocal about his vision of Bitcoin as principally a payment system, and that is, as he told, a useful as money. The economically minded vision is a sense of assisting on Bitcoin's core function as facilitating quick and easy transactions. It's also evident with Bitcoin Unlimited lead developer Andrew Stone. He said, BU is conceived to the discussion in the Go Cops and Bitcoin Up thread on this forum. Someone I forget who observed that the block size should be a network layer, not a consensus layer constrained and conceived on the merchant consistent mechanism to realize that thought. I then wrote the Articles of Federation with lots of help, drawing a lot of that first section from a philosophy statement written by Peter Rusin and other forum writings. I then released the first software version with EU, although we didn't call it that then, around Christmas 2015, held elections and, trans- and transitioned the project from a benevolent dictatorship to the framework as described in the articles in early 2016. On motivation, in the current climate, it is almost impossible to simply relay the motivation behind such projects by retroactively viewing them through the current debates. However, even a curious glance at the early inception of Bitcoin Unlimited most appears to be a sincere attempt to halt with the community views as a deviation from the Bitcoin's original vision and quite often expressed as Satoshi's vision. For BU, this is going to be broadly summarized as the primary primacy of the wide-scale adoption facilitated by transaction speeds and the necessity for consensus across the network. If emerging consensus functions are as anticipated, we will witness a synchronized adoption of the network towards increased block size in a movement that has been compared to a flock of birds working in harmony. While criticism of the core suggests that we would further centralize the network, Andrew Stone anticipates that if large mining pools choose to dominate the network with high difficulty blocks, smaller pools will simply switch to an alternative chain, effectively facilitating two economic niches. The ideal the ideological split between what is mean what it means to be decentralized currency at the level of practice pivots around the differing concepts of control. For BU, the block size limit is locus of an ideological game where the system can only remain decentralized if it, this is distributed across the nodes and miners. For them, the action of the core enforcing a hierarchical structure that can contradict the promise of a decentralized cryptocurrency based entirely on technical adaptiveness. Next steps. Whatever happens next will almost certainly confirm the suspicion of one side about the other. If Segway is adopted and, and adding a hair or unforeseen degree of technical complexity to the network, then we can enter a phase that confirms wide trust across the entire Bitcoin co- community and the, the vision of the core's team. If, however, the miners hold out and the unlimited results in a fork, whether now or later, or once again possibly blindsiding core, then we will have to face an ideological schism that asks us to speculate on what precisely we believe Bitcoin to be, which we will discuss in the way of Bitcoin. Uh, What Bitcoin Unlimited has brought to light is precisely two competing concepts over the essence of this entire project. And our worry is precisely this. Because the debate has become so (coughs) so polarized, it has become increasingly difficult to communicate across the divide. If Bitcoin can be partially understood as a consensus protocol, we must soon have to get better at doing just that. Uh, my biggest issue here is I don't think that the core team is being blindsided. Just simply because someone has a disagreement with you, has a different stance, and signals that stance doesn't make it blindsiding. Uh, it's pretty much the signaling of uh, all of this has been pretty much known and core has participated in either rebooting a lot of what Bitcoin Unlimited has done or the various discussions on the, all the different proposals. So this is not a blind side at all. And this is a decentralized system or attempt to be a decentralized system. And that includes those who seek to implement, do the core, you know, run the protocol. So here's the, uh, <clears throat> so I have a link to the forum here of uh, the gold collapsing uh, Bitcoin up. And then here is, it was published August 28th, 2015, uh, Peter R's statement on Bitcoin Unlimited. And all this will be linked in the show notes, like with everything else. So Bitcoin Unlimited, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system for the planet Earth, a scalable Bitcoin. The vision of Bitcoin Unlimited is a system that would scale up to a worldwide payment network and a decentralized monetary system. The transactions are grouped into blocks and reordered on an unforgivable global ledger known as the Bitcoin blockchain. The blockchain is accessible to anyone in the world, secured by cryptography, and maintained by the most powerful single-purpose computer network ever created. In certain cases, personalities might descend the Merc and become quasi-official figures, as evident in the proselytizing of Andres Anonopoulos, the Let the Code Speak for Itself, uh, Quietism of Peter Will, or the Informed Lindsay of Sam, Samson Moe. 
However, it's not always the case that important figures with the cryptocurrency ecosystem are visible at all, even when their actions have significant impact on the network. This is essentially true with the case of the Bitcoin Unlimited, uh, initials BU, where in, the con- in contrast to the well-known developers associated with Bitcoin Ca- uh, Classic, which is uh, Gavin Andreessen's, and Bitcoin XT, which is my current, which was the first uh, proposal that didn't exactly come from the Bitcoin core. Uh, the key developers of BU are not familiar names. A little bit of history, and then would it not be remiss in such an atmosphere if it not more than to make clear that in the end, the two sides of the debate are populated by pretty normal folk who are just happy to disagree on a pretty arcane set of ideas, a bit ideas with expensive re- repercussions. Early roots. Like most open source projects, Bitcoin Unlimited is broadly a virtual community consisting of a motley crew of developers, writers, journal- journalists, and onlookers. They are invariably people already involved with the Bitcoin for many years, and BU arose primarily from a single thread on the Bitcoin talk known as the gold collapsing Bitcoin up. Like numerous such threads, the base were often heated, quite personalized, and partisan. There are certain key figures at the time who seem to have a real impact on giving the new community a degree of confidence t- to expand beyond core. Uh, Dr. Peter Risen was clearly a significant voice and looks to have provided much of the intellectual weight behind BU's through it. Theoretical comments, such as how transaction fees would occur with a network without a block size limit. Uh, Risen's ideas are effectively a response to the possibility of removing the current limit of 1 megabyte, as expressed in BIP 101, an improvisational proposal authored by Gavin Andreessen, the proposed raising the block size limit to 8 megabits and implementing a biannual doubling thereafter in order to deal with the problem of full blocks and expensive transaction fees. BIP 101 was never adopted and has its own history with earlier scaling debates. However, it did inspire participants in the gold collapsing Bitcoin up thread to seek out new solutions. Gathering steam. Uh, the BU operation played out in the thread through summer 2015, gathering pace as the Bitcoin blockchain began to feature higher fees. According to Risen, the four-week transactional average record on June 2015 had grown 376 times greater than it was seen in September 2010. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine reports tens of thousands of unconfirmed transactions as a block size train to accommodate new network usage. A little later, a post by Risen in July 2015 noticed the average block site had bloated to 70% capacity and was continuing to surge. Uh, it's pretty much at capacity, even though there has been less transactions going on just because of the fee. I guess you might say that's our market response, but it's still it's still an issue. Uh, discussions on Bitcoin talk escalated, but the thread was soon locked in what the BU community read as a form of censorship. The perceived villain of the piece ha- here was Bitcoin talk administrator Thamos. And the same acquisition from BU members will carry over to our Bitcoin, another online platform also administrated by Thamos. Unlimited supporters turned to RPTC that, of course, core supporters have tended to consider heavily censored, resulting in a kind of intellectual split there. That whatever the technical details is written with, what can appear to the outsider is a quasi-conspiratorial uh, paranoia. The takeaway is that once untethered from the, the perceived poor, cl- poor climate of Thamos-dominated media, Bitcoin Unlimited set out on its own path, allowing for a period of off-grade development that would quietly emerge just as core supporters assumed the sacred, segregated witness would be implemented, which it wasn't. Grudge match. This essentially meant that when a form of, of competition did emerge, Bitcoin Core was blindsided and broadly unprepared. This does not mean they were technically not ready, but rather they had overlooked two subtle development miners, were not entirely convinced by uh, SegWit, and not everybody completely accepted that it was the obvious solution. The setup the scheme of ideological confrontation. On the forums at BU, the idea of a new Bitcoin software did not occur immediately. Such tasks required a dedicated developer or de- a development team. But it wasn't until Andrew Stone, uh, the Zurge, began to post the idea in an alternative client that was a, was a real movement. Here it is actually, BIP100, authorized by Jeff Garzik and others, that is most influential, influential since it explicitly puts the decision about removing the block size limit in the hands of the miners through a voting process. Those who have been following the debate will know that a large amount of current discussions center on the role of miners, most often a, a core of Chinese pools, and that to that extent should be influenced the future of the action of Bitcoin. Figures involved with these pools, such as Jean Wu, have taken almost a shadowy status and malign agents look to stall the adoption of SegWit in order to maintain their stranglehold on transaction fees. No doubt there is some truth to the claims of self-interest. Uh, you know, there's Ace of Boots, there's other things. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about Doomsday scenarios and uh, when we talk about those who are against uh, both segwits or just one over the other, nobody is surely naive to think that otherwise. However, the salient aspect of Bitcoin Unlimited is that 
Having the miners on the side meant then having a voice. The kickoff. If Bitcoin can be read, and no doubt many will have other interpretations as a set of influential blocks, not always in competition, then the two most influential voices are surely those of core development team, technical credentials, and the large Chinese mining pools, hash rate credentials. The current scaling debate only really kicks off when it becomes clear that not only are many of the major pools not supporting SegWit, but they're actually signaling for Bitcoin Unlimited. This is thought by many as a very risky, risking a hard fork of the network into rival blockchains, given how serious the division between core and unlimited are. The, uncurrent, the undercurrent to all this are the socioeconomic arguments underlying Bitcoin Unlimited. In Peter Risen's original BU white paper, you first encounter a, a now uh, similar familiar concept in the emerging consensus, EC, which we define. And EC maintains that given the economic incentive remaining on the same chain, miners will reconfigure their blocks to size to match the majority of the network. Notably, the white paper includes a section that explicitly, explicitly about the values, not just the technical themes, and that can be summarized as a focus on the speedy transaction of Bitcoin as cash, not gold, ensuring low fees and being censorship resistant. It's perhaps that this approach that first caught the attention of the noted Bitcoin investor, Roger Baer, who told us, I actually don't recall where I first came across BU, but I suspect it was Reddit. Avir almost certainly must have come across a browser in the subreddit sympathetic to Classic and XT, but one could easily see why he found BU appealing. As an outspoken investor, he's been constantly vocal about his vision of Bitcoin as principally a payment system, and that is, as he told, a useful as money. The economically minded vision is a sense of assisting on Bitcoin's core function as facilitating quick and easy transactions. It's also evident with Bitcoin Unlimited lead developer Andrew Stone. He said, BU is conceived to the discussion in the gold cops in Bitcoin up, thread on this forum. Some, one I forget, who observed that the block size should be a network layer, not a consensus layer, constrained and conceived on the merchant consistent mechanism to realize that thought. I then wrote the Articles of Federation with lots of help, drawing a lot of that first section from a philosophy statement written by Peter Risen and other forum writings. I then released the first software version with EU, although we didn't call it that then, around Christmas 2015. Held elections and, tran and transitioned the project from a benevolent dictatorship to the framework of described in the articles in early 2016. On motivation, in the current climate, it is almost impossible to simply relay the motivation behind such projects by retroactively viewing them through the current debates. However, even a curious glance at the early inception of Bitcoin Unlimited most appears to be a sincere attempt to halt what the community views as a deviation from the Bitcoin's original vision and quite often expressed as Satoshi's vision. For BU, this is going to be broadly summarized as the primary primacy of the wide-scale adoption facilitated by transaction speeds the necessary for consensus across the network. If emerging consensus functions are as anticipated, we will witness a synchronized adoption of the network towards increased block size in a movement that has been compared to a flock of birds working in harmony. While criticism of the core suggests that we would further centralize the network, Andrew Stone anticipates that if large mining pools choose to dominate the network with high difficulty blocks, smaller pools will simply switch to an alternative chain, effectively facilitating two economic niches. The ideal the ideology will split between what is mean what it means to be decentralized currency at the level of practice pivots around the differing concepts of control. For BU, the block size limit is locus of ideological game where the system can only remain decentralized if it, this is distributed across the nodes and miners. For then the action of the core enforcing a hierarchical structure that can contradict the promise of a decentralized cryptocurrency based entirely on technical adaptiveness. Next steps. Whatever happens next will almost certainly confirm the suspicion of one side about the other. If Segway is adopted and, and adding a hair or unforeseen degree of technical complexity to the network, then we can enter a phase that confirms wide trust across the entire Bitcoin community and the, the vision of the forest team. If, however, the miners hold out and the unlimited results in a fork, whether now or later, or once again possibly blindsiding core, then we will have to face an ideological schism that asks us to speculate on what precisely we believe Bitcoin to be which we will discuss in the way of Bitcoin. Uh, what Bitcoin Unlimited has brought to light is precisely two competing concepts over the essence of this entire project. And our worry is precisely this. Because the debate has become so, <coughs> so polarized, it has become increasingly difficult to communicate across the divide. If Bitcoin can be partially understood as a consensus protocol, we must soon have to get better at doing just that. Uh, my biggest issue here is I don't think that the core team is being blindsided. Just simply because someone has a disagreement with you, has a different stance, and signals that stance doesn't make it blindsiding. Uh, it's pretty much the signaling of uh, all this has been pretty much known, and core has participated in 
either rebooting a lot of what Bitcoin Unlimited has done or the various discussions on the, all the different proposals. So this is not a blind side at all. And this is a decentralized system or attempt to be a decentralized system. And that includes those who seek to implement, do the core, you know, run the protocol. So here's the, uh, <clears throat> so I have a link to the forum here of uh, the gold collapsing uh, Bitcoin up. And then here is, it was published August 28th, 2015, uh, Peter R's statement on Bitcoin Unlimited. And all this will be linked in the show notes, like with everything else. So Bitcoin Unlimited, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system for the planet Earth, a scalable Bitcoin. The vision of Bitcoin Unlimited is a system that would scale up to a worldwide payment network and a decentralized monetary system. The transactions are grouped into blocks and reordered on an unforgivable global ledger known as the Bitcoin blockchain. The blockchain is accessible to anyone in the world, secured by cryptography, and maintained by the most powerful single-purpose computer network ever created. Governed by the code we run, the guiding principle of Bitcoin Unlimited is that the evolution of the network should be decided by the code people freely choose to run. Consensus is then an emergent property objectively represented by the longest proof of working chain. What makes a valid block? From the Bitcoin white paper, nodes accept the block only if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent. A block cannot be invalid because of its size. Instead, excessively large blocks that would pose technical challenge to the node are dealt with it within the transport layer, increasing the block size, blocks orphan risk. Bitcoin Unlimited nodes can accept the chain with an excessive block when needed in order to track consensus. Values and beliefs adoption and paramount. Bitcoin should freely scale with the demand through a market-based process. The user experience is important. Low fees are desirable. Instant or zero confirmation transactions are useful. Resistance to censorship and security against double spinning improves with adoption. Technically put the user in control. Software software fork of Bitcoin core. Bitcoin Unlimited can simultaneously flag support for multiple block size limit proposals, BIP100 and BIP101, etc., uh, the block size limit is considered to be part of the transport layer rather than part of the consensus layer. The user can adjust his node's block size limit. Ooh, he uses his. Limited based on the technical limitations of the person's hardware while still ensuring that the person's node follows the longest proof of work chain. Politics, uh, Bitcoin, and, inter- and interdisciplinary. The voices of scientists, developers, entrepreneurs, investors, and users should all be heard and respected. Uh, critiques, I'm trying to come up with simple one pager that communicates the most important points. So this is the part where, um, you know, this is the kind of the philosophy behind Bitcoin Unlimited. And this is a result of the whole uh, gold claps, uh, Bitcoin up uh, through the, the Bitcoin forums and stuff, the Bitcoin talk. So just a little bit of a reminder about uh, BIP100 and BIP101. So BIP100 is a consensus hard fork, a dynamic maximum block size by minor vote by Jeff Garzik. Tom Harding and Danger Valbert uh, first came on the scene um, June 11, 2015. I believe they made some, yeah, we talked about the improvements that they had made. Uh, it replacing the static one um, megabyte size hard limit with a hard limit set by Coinbase vote, conducted on the same schedule as difficulty in retargeting. Um, their motivations, miners directly feel the effects, both positive and negative, of any maximum block size change imposed by their peers. Larger blocks allow more growth in the on-chain ecosystem, while smaller blocks reduce resource requirements network-wide. Miners can also act as an efficient proxy for the rest of the ecosystem, since they are paid in tokens collected for the blocks they created. A simple deterministic system is specified where a 75% mining supermajority may activate a change in the maximum block size each 2016 blocks. Each change is limited to a 5% increase from the previous block size hard limit, or a decrease of similar magnitude. Among adopting nodes, there will be no disagreement of the evolution of the maximum block size. The system is compatible with emergent consensus, but whereas under the system a miner may choose to accept any size block, a miner following BIP100 observes the 75% supermajority rule and the 5% chain limit rule. Excessive block values signaled by emergent consensus blocks are considered in the calculation of the BIP100 block size hard limit, and the BIP100 calculation max block, maximum block size is signaled as an excessive block value for the benefit of all observers. So that's a bit of the abstract and the motivation there for BIP100. You know, BIP100 was part of Bitcoin XT, and BIP101 was part of Bitcoin Classic. So BIP101, oh no, yeah, Gavin Andreessen, uh, Consensus Hard Fork, 
uh, June 22nd of 2015 is when it was created. Uh, the bid process replacing the fixed one megabyte maximum block size with a maximum size that grows over time at a predictable rate. Motivation, transaction volume of the Bitcoin network has been growing and will still reach the one megabyte every 10 minute limit imposed by the one megabyte maximum block size. Increasing the si maximum size reduces the impact of the limit on the Bitcoin adoption and growth. And then it goes, uh, we already talked about the specifications and on forward. Bitcoin Unlimited in and of itself also has its own GitHub where it has uh, what I'm calling the burp. And in fact, has it's called a Bitcoin Unlimited Improvement Proposal. It has a total of 61 um, burps in here at various uh, stages. Many of them pass some are draft. Uh, to submit a burp, please post your proposal and it has a link to their form where you can uh, proposal. Well, once we agree on the number assigned to your proposal and copy edit if needed, your proposal will be voted by the BU members to pass your proposal. It needs to gather a majority of BU members votes and then at the same time reach the quorum. So we're going to read a little bit from these articles, but just so you know, they have their entire separate GitHub. These burps are um, done in a different manner than the the BIPs, if you will. And basically what it is, is what some people are seeking, and we'll talk about it uh, when we talk about, uh, re, uh, speak about emerging consensus of decentralizing the development of Bitcoin, where you're not dependent on just one set of developers, where you can have many developers working on the protocol and whomever has the best code, if you will, uh, the best testing, the best proposal, um, and gets the consensus of the community should be the, the code that is implemented, if you will. Now, one other BIP I want to talk about before we move on is um, BIP 109. Uh, BIP 109 is part of Bitcoin Unlimited, which is the, the we're going to, it's Gavin Andreessen. It's a consensus hard fork. It's a 2 million bit byte size limit with a SIG pop and sash hat limit. So, abstract the motivation one time increase in the total amount of transaction data permitted in the block from one megabyte to two megabytes who limits on signature operation and hashing motivation one continue current economic policy to exercise hard fork network upgrades three mitigate potential cpu exhaustion attacks so this is just um where the minimum instead of being one megabyte will be two megabytes and then you can have the exchange the extension blocks where you can go up higher if you will uh, based on the network hashing rate. So if they want to do four, five, six, eight, but instead of having one, it's going to be two megabytes as a minimum, um, with the incorporation of BIP 109 into the Bitcoin Unlimited code. So Bitcoin Unlimited has an Articles of Federation. It's 12 pages. I'll have a link in the show notes, but I just want to read a bit from the first page, which is just kind of a, a statement, if you will, of what it's all about. So Bitcoin is in the crossroads that will determine whether it becomes a worldwide public good embodying a trustless ledger and currency for all people, companies, and financial institutions worldwide. The Bitcoin Unlimited project seeks to provide a voice in terms of code and hash power to all stakeholders in the Bitcoin ecosystem. A fundamental principle, principle we assert is that Bitcoin is and should be whatever the users define by the code they run and the rules that they vote for with their hash power. This project seeks to remove existing practical barriers to stakeholders expressing their views in these ways. We see in the Bitcoin ecosystem many companies, groups, and economic actors that have been large investment decisions based on maintaining the current trajectory of growth, a growth that would naturally ensure if Bitcoin is available as a public good. These include payment processors, micropayment solutions, exchanges, merchants, and more. We recognize the importance of the mining industry and the necessity to increase transaction revenue to support its growth as the block subsidy decreases. This growth is in line with the interests of the Bitcoin network as a whole since it increases network security. In the Bitcoin core variant, we do not see a venue for these actors who formally express their desires in regards to the evolution of the network. Instead, we see a project controlled by a small group of developers employed by finance-oriented for-profit startup companies and the emergence of corporate products, lightning network sidechains, and permission ledgers that would materially benefit from a Bitcoin network that is incapable of handling the transactional demand required for a worldwide public good. We'll, like I said, we'll talk about with Lightning Network. We already defined what they are, like Lightning Network side chains. Um, I'm gonna have to see what how they're defining what permission ledgers are. But there, we will get into some of the negatives with all these different proposals and some of the things that have been happening. A lot of it is flood. Some of it is innuendo, but some of it is actually very concrete 
truthful things. It is really about, about your perspective, again, about the way you want to Bitcoin. Whether these corporate developers are intentionally acting against the long-term success of Bitcoin is relevant. In case of potential conflict of interest, the ethical and social accepted behavior should be to rescue oneself from such a position of influence. Instead, these developers insist on a poorly defined consensus for determining the development of a MIT licensed code base, which they did not intentionally create. This tactic has the opposite effect of a recusal, giving themselves veto power over any changes. This has stalled improvements on the block size issue in the Bitcoin Core variant. Bitcoin Unlimited perceives itself as an important element in the Bitcoin ecosystem. We believe our founding statutes are firmly based on the Satoshi original version. Vision. However, we acknowledge that Bitcoin is fundamentally a decentralized system and thus we will not assert centralized ownership of the protocol. And within the Bitcoin Unlimited climate, we aim to help people assert and express their own freedom of choice. So Article 1, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system for planet Earth. 1. Satoshi's original vision is scalable Bitcoin. So Bitcoin Unlimited adheres to the Satoshi Nakamoto vision of a system that could scale up to a worldwide payment network and decentralized monetary system. Transactions are grouped into blocks and recorded on a f- unforgivable global ledger known as the Bitcoin blockchain. The blockchain is accessible to anyone in the world, secured by cryptography, and maintained by the most powerful single-purpose computing network ever created. So it's kind of reiterating some of the principles that Peter R. Uh, talked about. The second article is governed by Code We Run. What makes a valid block, values and beliefs adoption and paramount, technical but the user's control, politics, Bitcoin, and an interpersonal confederation. Um, one, all Bitcoins unlimited here for BU activity should be recorded and publicly accessible. Two, BU roles should be consist of a president, a publicly identified real life identity is known. BU members are responsible for the ongoing activities of the confederation. The president shall resolve uh, burps, number complex, organize burp dis- discussions in the forum designated by the secretary, schedule and initiate voting within limits specified in these articles. So they define like secretary, developer, member, pool operator, officers in term for two years. For continuity, elections should be staggered by six months in the place one week prior to responsible transfer, uh, beginning with the president of January 15 of 2018, then the secretary, developer, and pool operator. Uh, formal interactions, decisions should be made via the following procedures, is four, and so on and so forth. So they break down uh, what they are all about, their operations and resources. Uh, their memories are publicly known. They have a pretty transparent as far as their forums where you can find everything. There's nothing really leaked as far as emails or anything like that. And Bitcoin Core is fairly very open, but they're... There has been some issues, um, and it's not coming from Bitcoin Core when it comes to Segwit uh, 2x. How it, no one's really seen the actual update or protocol, if you will. So that is, you know, what Bitcoin Unlimited is. We're going to talk about emerging consensus, and then we're going to pull everything together and just kind of break down in essence what Bitcoin Unlimited is. So emerging consensus, uh, we touched on this before. Uh, we're just going to reiterate it because this is part of Bitcoin Unlimited. So, Introduction to Emerging Consensus from Andrew Clifford. The principles of emergence in nature can be applied in the Bitcoin network to enable emerging consensus or block size limit, referred to as EC. Emerging fundamental to nature. Emergence is everywhere in nature, from crystals to snowflakes to spiraling shapes of the galaxies, microscopic properties of liquid to weather patterns, ant hills, and living organisms. Yet this is a Cinderella science because the phenomenon of emergence is difficult to predict, except in simple cases. The field of the study of complexity, therefore, includes complex adaptive systems. Such systems have many individual interacting according to the simple rules and thereby producing second-order or system-wide effects. Emergence in nature. Emerging everywhere in fundamental complexity, discrete entities A, interaction B, high-level order C, top-down causation D, self-organization hier- and, hier- and hierarchical. So there's a little graph that kind of breaks that down, A, B, C, and D. This graph by anthropologist uh, Richard Steele breaks down the process of emergence. In the beginning at A, with the discrete entities such as molecules, molecule, <coughs> molecules in, insects, or humans. At B, there's interaction. A construct emerges in C, transcending the entities. It would be a vortex, a beehive, or a market price. Finally, in D, there's a top-down causation shaping how individual entities behave. Causation takes varied forms like natural selection or adaptive information control. Emergence drives self-organization, and it can be hierarchical with many layers, such as the multicellular biology, uh, 
reductionism fails at first base because not every, not even all the layers are known. Emergent property is simultaneously part of a system and can also, and also external to it. Emergence depends upon a system to become manifest by all, by also transcending it at the same time. So, uh, emerging consensus decentralized block size limit. Bitcoin can harness emergence to achieve problem solving benefits. The reason is that it's a global network comprised of thousands of independent nodes which are usually owned by different people. Bitcoin nodes also communicate to each other via peer to peer message interaction. These features mean that the addition of simple rules allows complex network wide behavior to develop outside the message layer. This is already emergent consensus from the Bitcoin network, the market price of BTC. This is determined on exchange by buyers and sellers. Although the market price is outside the network, it would vanish if the network itself vanish. Bitcoin nodes which participate in EC simply need to allow flexibility to determine a block size limit. Flexibility where full node owners set the maximum size for blocks that will make and accept also the delay for acceptance of oversized blocks. The, cap the, cap the capability for delayed acceptance effectively makes nodes become fork tolerant where forks exist due to block size limit disagreement. Because of this, the forks will always be transient. Bitcoin full nodes interact during block propagation. The difference in EC, in EC is settings have a holistic effect on participating nodes, and once cri critical mass occurs, the emergence results affecting a very varying block size limit on the entire network by top-down feedback. A top-down block size limit is an irrational number that oscillates as node owners change their settings. It can never be known exactly, only approximately. Uh, security ex aspects of the Bitcoin business can be handled in EC implementation. Consider the case for a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, which treats transac transactions as final after three confirm confirmations. In this case, the addition of software which detects a fork situation can provide an automatic stop on treating transactions as final until the temporary fork is resolved completely. Such a safety net would rarely inc inconvenience users. Uh, the Bitcoin implementation of EC, EC enabled. One of the features of the EC is that the development teams can choose different methodologies for nodes to converge on an EC-driven block size limit. In this situation, the actual prevailing limit becomes a meta consensus or a second layer of consensus, which is optimal since that is a lower layer is weighed by a number of nodes which use the different flavors of EC. Of EC. The links are provided for detailed explanation how EC is used in different Bitcoin implementations, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, and Bitcoin XT. And we kind of covered this when we talked about but in essence, it's just a, a different mechanisms of getting consensus. And, you know, many people are um, leery, weary, weary of this because, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto's consensus does work. It, it does. And if it's, if it's not broken, then why change? And it doesn't necessarily need fixing, per se. Maybe the threshold for consensus may need fixing, but the actual consensus in itself, we'll see. I mean, this is all coming to a head and everything. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited still has a lot of nodes out there that are operational. Uh, miners are mining Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, we're going to talk about that support right now. I'm really hesitant on emerging consensus. I think it's a neat idea, but I, do, I just need to see more, if you will say, uh, more of a test net market. Uh, more of a demonstration, more of uh, this information being out in the wild and being attacked in attempts to break it because Bitcoin as it, as it is now has been out in the wild for almost nine years and it thus far has not been broken. That's my little bit of hesitation on emerging consensus. So some of the people that are supporting um, Bitcoin Unlimited are uh, companies like VIBTC, which is a mining pool and they are mining Bitcoin Unlimited. So this article comes from Coindesk. It came out October 20th, 20th of 2016 by Jacob Donnelly. A VPTTC um, is still a supporter of Bitcoin Unlimited. So Bitcoin's most professional mining pool has become its most controversial, and that professional part is in quotes. Following months of debate on how to scale Bitcoin's transaction capacity, the conversation has become newly contentious as progressive or much hype solutions continue to face the kind of delays that perhaps should be expected when working with novel technologies. The lack of progress real or perceived has so far more, far, so far most affected Bitcoin's business community, many which are dependent on technical improvements in the network for additional growth. Indeed, while Bitcoin's primary development group has its share of detractors, the majority of startups and services providers continue to support Bitcoin Core and it works. 
But for one readily new Bitcoin mining pool has its way, a much anticipated scaling solution could be dead on arrival. In recent weeks, China's Via BTC became one of the first providers of mining software to switch its client from the official version provided by Bitcoin Core to an option provided by Bitcoin Unlimited. A rival development group that supports alternative methods of scaling is focused on create, creating a more viable Bitcoin block size. Uh, but unlike Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Unlimited does not have support for that developer's group signature scale solution, Segregated Witness, a planned technical fix that could effectively make uh, Bitcoin's block size about 1.8 times larger than it is today by changing how information is counted towards this total. Further, because the rules of Segregated Witness requires 95% of Bitcoin's hashing power to approve the transition, VEPTC effectively blocks its wider release. According to the blockchain info over the past 24 hours, VEPTC has accounted for 7.3% of the blocks discovery, though this has been as high as 9.6% in recent days. So yeah, this is a big issue about getting miners on board because if you because of the thresholds, and even if they dropped it down to 80%, which is one of the Segit Segit Witness um, solutions, uh, you can still have the, the possibility of a fork. So dropping down in here, so getting to BPTC, so there's a bit of a statement here. Um, so complicating the matters despite the consensus developers suggest the segregated way this is the best way to scale Bitcoin. Uh, via, PTC, via, via BTC remains unconvinced in a blog post issued last week. Uh, via BTC criticized the proposal which suggested it would have fundamentally alter the structure of Bitcoin transactions. In an interview with Coindesk, high up Yang, the founder and CEO of VPTC, said that there was nothing that would change his mind about continuing to support multiple developer groups. He said, I believe Bitcoin needs more development teams, and I've decided to support Bitcoin Unlimited. He's also said, as far as I can tell, Bitcoin Unlimited is gaining more and more support, at least interest, including from several large pools, and I believe Bitcoin Unlimited will probably succeed. However, Xang explains the quality of team software is simply a cut, a cut above what is offered by the market. He said, it's the fastest pool for finding broadcasting blocks since the beginning. We've had zero orphan blocks. So their support has to do with they want more, more development teams. When asked whether BPT would be willing to compromise if Bitcoin Unlimited did not gain further hash rate, he offered an opportunity, an opportunity for conversation. He said, if we do remain at a standstill, I think both sides should sit down and open friendly discussion to find compromise or make concessions so that Bitcoin can move forward. And this is their statement. Why we must increase the block size and why I support Bitcoin Unlimited. This is from uh, via PTC. This article was originally published in Chinese on my personal blog. On October 10th, 2016, right after the conclusion of the Scaling Bitcoin Milan, the third in the series of conference on the topic of scaling the Bitcoin network, I made the decision to switch to Bitcoin client software that, that uh, via PTC runs from Bitcoin Core to Bitcoin Unlimited. The decision was not made lightly. I do not believe I have the right to impose my own personal views on the users of my pool, but after consulting with all the larger users of my pool, I was able to make the decision with their overwhelming support. The decision whether or not to increase the block size beyond one megabyte is ultimately made by the miners. But in specific case of this issue, it is actually the pool owners, not the hardware operators, who have the experience required to make such a decision. As we are seeing now and have seen in the past, it turns out that the miners, that is, those who own the hardware, do not actually care enough one way or another to cast a vote about making changes to the Bitcoin protocol. It is my belief that the decision of which software to run is the responsibility of the mining pools and that the, the, waiting, the waiting for miners or the Bitcoin developers to decide the course of action for the network is incorrect. So this is a, kind of a very uniquely different perspective on who has a say on the network. Currently, VPTC is singling a vote for two megabyte blocks in the coin base of the blocks that we mine. Although we continue to produce blocks with a maximum size of one megabyte so as to follow what is currently accepted by the Nakamoto consensus to, to be the rules of the Bitcoin network. Based on the tests we have run, we know that the network is entirely capable of handling two megabyte blocks with no noticeable performance decreases, which is to say that the fears about increasing the two megabyte blocks can be put to rest. The initial change to supporting larger blocks will require a hard fork. However, the switch to Bitcoin Unlimited is good for a long-term health of the network since this brings Finality and limits any further need to either soft or hard forks to alter to alter the block size. I intentionally disable Bitcoin's unlimited default signaling for a BIP 109 because we do not believe that BIP 109 is the correct solution towards the change changing the block size. I hope that the developers of Bitcoin Unlimited can remove BIP 109 as a default setting from the client software and avoid any further misunderstandings. From the moment that uh, VPTC mined our first Bitcoin Unlimited blocks, there has been an overwhelming large reaction from within the Bitcoin community 
Most of it was supported, but there's also been controversy in pulling these objectors. So I feel that it's necessary for me to write about my decision in order to clear up some of the many misconceptions as well as to further explain my point of view. So I'm going to skip around here because he kind of covers a lot of uh, different issues with his statement. But the key one here is why Bitcoin needs bigger blocks. Very simply put, if the block size is not increased, then the Bitcoin's growth will have halted at a level of adoption it is at today, and Bitcoin may as well be considered a failed experiment. That's not to say that cryptocurrency itself will be a failed experiment. There will certainly be other cryptocurrencies capable of capitalizing on the growing user demand that the Bitcoin currently Bitcoin is currently incapable of meeting. Bitcoin is still in its early stage of development, although we see incredible growth and adoption over the previous eight years. There's, there's a long way to go. However, Bitcoin has currently hit a wall regarding its growth and new user acquisition. The barrier is exceptionally opposed by the artificial one megabyte block size constraint. In my eyes, this refusal to evolve is no different from network suicide. Kind of skipping here, why segregated witness is a bad idea. As I've often re repeated towards pointing out, is the introduction of segregated witness will provide greater security and an effective block size increase in to 1.7 megabytes and therefore should be supported. This is missing the forest from the trees, as an effective increase to 1.7 1 megabytes merely delays the death of Bitcoin, entirely misses the point of scaling. It fails to solve the fundamental issue at hand. The activation of SegWit on the network does not mean that all users of Bitcoin will immediately be able to take advantage of its benefits since it will require at least a year for the effective block size to increase to 1.7 megabytes. This is little to alleviate the current congestion on the blockchain. Furthermore, the introduction of segregate witness brings with it an enormous amount of technical debt, which will require fundamentally altering the structure of Bitcoin transactions and requiring all nodes, mining, pools, block explorers, wallets, Bitcoin ATMs, exchanges, and other applications to do a complete refactoring of their software. Skipping down, why Light Lightning Network is not a sufficient scaling solution. First of all, the actual use case of Lightning are fairly limited. Ask yourself why people use Bitcoin. It's because they want fast confirmation times, or at least because they want to use a decentralized money that is not controlled by one organization. Bitcoin trades off speed and resources efficiently for resilience and safety, and Bitcoin's slow confirmation times are not in any sense problematic. Secondly, to characterize Bitcoin transactions on the Lightning Network as Bitcoin transactions is false. They're only Bitcoin transactions in the sense of exchange, altering balances in the internal database is making Bitcoin transactions. Deploying the Lightning Network is, in fact, makes consumer use of Bitcoin even more of a hassle. The deployment of Lightning Network will lead to the creation of centralized hubs where users should be required to lock up their coins within these hubs in order to have them available for transactions. This, is, this differs only slightly from the current banking system from which Bitcoin was meant to escape. And skipping down. Why I support Bitcoin Unlimited? As a community, we have wasted years debating the ultimate trivial technical qu questions of block size. It's time to implement a positive solution once and for all. To resolve the question of block size limit, to hard code on the protocol level whether blocks should be larger or smaller is fruitless and will lead to even more conflicts down the road. We should give the question of block size to the free market inside. It will naturally adjust to, the pay to be in pace with ever-improving network and technological constraints. Bitcoin's unlimited decision to hand over block size limit setting to the miners guarantees that the block size will follow what the Bitcoin network is capable of handling safely. Uh, Bitcoin Unlimited allows miners to set both the maximum block size they will produce and the maximum size they are willing to accept, with both signals included in the Coinbase script of each block. If a node discovers that a chain with a larger block is already four blocks, the difficulty setting ahead of the chain is currently on. It will automatically switch and acknowledge this long, longer chain as a valid one in accordance with the Nakamoto consensus rules. This makes future block size adjustments easy and prevents the issue from ever becoming a contentious as it had been for the previous two years. Uh, why hard forks pose no threats? The greatest danger of a hard fork is to say that it will produce a scenario in which there are two blockchains and thus two different versions of Bitcoin. But far as I can tell, that is a scalability debate. The vast majority agree that the block size needs to grow sooner or later, while the main difference of opinions over the method used to achieve this. The reason the recent Ethereum hard fork produced two different versions of Ethereum was because the fundamental quality of the ledger, namely its immutability, was permanently changed. Furthermore, because Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment period is two weeks long with a 10 minute per block, whichever branch of the chain is the majority of the hash rate behind it is almost certainly guaranteed to be a divisive winner. The chances of the fork producing two different Bitcoins are low. The minority chain will have a much slower block production time and irrational miners will switch to the majority chain to avoid mining at loss. The only rational choice of a miner will be to join the, support, the chain supported by economic majority. Yeah, but there are people out there that just want to see the world burn, so I still think that there could be a strong split within the chain, and that there could be a minority chain. How the hard fork should be implemented. If Bitcoin Unlimited is written, there is no set th threshold at which a hard fork is initiated. 
In theory, the hard fork could be initiated any time majority of hash rate is in agreement. Done improperly, this is dangerous and not a meaningful way to make protocol changes. With Bitcoin Unlimited, a minor majority is required to decide together the hard fork will happen. Only then will the miners come to an agreement on the hard fork activation date. First, under what circumstances should a hard fork be initiated? I recommend following Bitcoin's classic 75% threshold. In other words, a hard fork would be initiated only after more than 75% of the network hash rate is supporting Bitcoin Unlimited. If the consensus threshold is set too high, then reaching consensus will be unattainable. A single determined mining pool would veto a change for the entire network. A 75% threshold is a perfectly adequate to perform a hard fork safely. Secondly, how do we decide the timing of the hard fork? My recommendation is the fork be performed at least one month after the 75% activation threshold is reached. This will give the community ample time to upgrade the node software in preparation. The fork should be timed so that it occurs immediately after the network difficulty adjustment, and this makes it economically un feasible to remain on a minority chain and eliminates the risk of two Bitcoin situation arising. This is not the Nak this is a Nakamoto consensus working as intended. Conclusion. My assessment of various scaling proposals put forth by Bitcoin Core and Blockstream as a scaling Bitcoin Milan is that they all seem to cut off their nose despite their face. For reasons that remain unclear to me, they wanted to destroy the unique monetary properties of Bitcoin and destroy the business models of the miners who secure the Bitcoin network. The interests of Bitcoin miners and everyday users are strongly aligned, but working together and identifying common interests, we can bring about a, a renaissance in Bitcoin and bring mutual benefits to all parties involved. By working together as a united community of developers, miners, users, and businesses, we can demonstrate to the world that the Bitcoin network can be adaptive, anti-fragile, and resistant to centralization. So that is why one particular mining pool has um, supported uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. So just kind of cover what Bitcoin Unlimited is. It's a separate development team, separate set of protocols and GitHubs um, that has been launched in 2016. It has nodes, it has miners, it's a totally different software protocol based off Bitcoin Core but with the additions to allow for emerging consistency and this kind of dynamic block or um, extension block uh, concept where you can have a, a Bitcoin block size at any limit. There's no set hard limit, if you will, and it's decided by the miners. So that pretty much covers what Bitcoin Unlimited is. Um, it does, in fact, have, like we discussed earlier in the episode, it does, in fact, have some support. It doesn't have a majority support. There's still Bitcoin Core. It's a counter proposal to, you know, what Bitcoin Core has done, what is out there with Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin XT. It also has a flexibility that it will allow if, like, for example, if you're running the Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, it will allow if, for example, Bitcoin Classic were to become the majority uh, solution or Bitcoin XT. It allows for that flexibility. It's built in to enable for that consensus to be recognized by the Bitcoin Unlimited nodes and even the miners. But what it does not have built in it is segregated witness. It's a pretty much against segregated witness. Because of the nature of what uh, segregated witness is, uh, there's a disagreement by individuals who support this protocol. And even as the miner, uh, the mining pool has stated, they think it changes Bitcoin too much, if you will, and changes the very nature of Bitcoin. So that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you. And until next time. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.